So, the talk I'm doing today is called Our Big, Big Yahweh, or God. Um, and I like to put both up there because sometimes we're in other groups that aren't onto the Yahweh page yet, so I try to be lead people gently. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <clears throat> you've heard, and last time we were here I talked about the frequencies, I talked about um, a little bit about the tabernacle frequencies, I'll talk about that a little bit more today. But I wanted to kind of go a little deeper as it were, and give you a picture of why in the world are we even interested in this. Uh, and that's what I want you to go, with to, away, go home with today. And so the first thing I wanted to do, and there's a, there's a clip in here that I hope is, we're going to be able to figure it out, because I've got it on my computer, but I'm not sure how the sound's going to come out on it, but I hope we can get it because it's just incredible when you start thinking about it. Um, the first thing I would like to do is, let's just go to the scripture, Psalm 19, David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man running a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of Yahweh are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, and sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them is a great reward. And who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret, secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, and let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and shall I be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yah my strength, and my Redeemer. So my question is, how do the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh? Have you ever thought about that? We read these words, Psalm 19 is a really, I mean, I remember memorizing it when I was a kid. And um, I had never put a thought into it. What does that mean for the heavens to declare the glory of God. You know, Job says that the morning stars sang together. We, we get some ideas that there's something going on beyond our initial perception of things. And that's where I want to dig in today a little bit. <clears throat> in order to understand the sounds of God, we need to look at what He created. In Genesis 1-3 it says that, let there be light, He says. Have you ever stopped to think about what that means? What is light? As we look deeper into what light is, light is a full electromagnetic spectrum. It has the colors that we see. I see red and blue and green. and Those are part of that spectrum, but there's all kinds of other aspects to that spectrum of light. So when he says light be, my belief is he was actually placing that electromagnetic spectrum into place. He's putting it into place. And all of the laws that surround it. It's interesting when, you know, physicists today, they have all these laws about how light works and the wavelengths and, the, and all these things. And when you stop and think about it, all of that, my belief is when Yah said, light be... That's, he was putting that into place. I further believe that he actually sang that. Um, and there are others, um, even in the Talmud, you'll find references to, to Yahweh saying the world into existence. 
And so that would mean that he would have used specific frequencies because when I sing a, a note, oh, that's a specific frequency. And I happen to believe that Yahweh is specific enough in his design that if he sang it at a specific frequency, there was a reason why he used that frequency. And that's why I think it's so important to be understanding these frequencies today. And, that, and I believe that we're in a time, we're in a prophetic time and a historic time when it's important for us to begin to understand what this is all about. Because I think the Father put it here for us, for our benefit. And so, it, you know, there's one place it says it's a, it's a, how does it, how does the words go? It's a, anyway, it's a really good thing for a king to search out a matter, to look deeper into things. And I think that's, we're called to do that as well. So that's, that's what this, that's where I'm going with this today. Um, we also know, and there, I, 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 I try to clarify this because last time I talked, um, or my older talks, I should say, but last time I was here, I talked about the sound frequencies and then the colors that go along with those frequencies. Now, sound frequencies are different than the electromagnetic spectrum, so I just wanted to go this, over this real quickly. Um, the electromagnetic s spectrum, light, can travel through a vacuum, and so it doesn't need any kind of medium. It's, it's an energy wave. It's protons being moved in wave patterns through with energy driving it. And it doesn't need air or water or something to go through. Sound needs to have a medium to go through. And so when we talk about hertz in sound, we're talking about wave, number of waves per second. And light has hertz as well. It has waves per second as well. But it's a different kind of wave, so just so you understand. So when we when we start to correlate colors to sound, it's not a direct linear relationship the way you would think. Okay, so that's why. And I'll just give you an example. The first frequency we find in scripture is 396, and the last one we find is 852. Well, 852 is obviously more than twice what 396 is. So why isn't it back to the to the red or orange? Well, it's because the sound and light are two different types of frequencies. So, but there is a, a spread because we have the spectrum of light and we have the spectrum of sound. Okay, and there's a relationship between the two, but it's not a direct linear. So I just so you understand that. So that's why 852 can be related to purple colors, and the 396 can be related to red colors. Okay. That's probably about as clear as mud, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, I I always get that question, so I'm just kind of putting that in here because they, my belief is that Yahweh, when he designed both of those spectrums, he knew what he was doing and he did it for a reason. He put a rainbow up there for a reason, and that's your color spectrum. And he also put sound up there for a reason, and that's our sound spectrum. Okay, is that maybe that makes it a little easier? Okay. So, how big is this universe that Yahweh made? You know, even scientists talk about the known universe and the unknown universe. <laughs> so, what they're saying is, we don't know how big it is. We talk about light years, um, but how far is a light year? We, we, we have this um, Hubble telescope we got up there in space, and all of a sudden we started seeing all kinds of more galaxies that we didn't even know were there because we couldn't see them before, but now we can see them, so now we go up. And then the question is, well, what happens if we put a Hubble Hubble up there? <laughs> okay, or a Hubble with a bigger uh, magnification, which they're trying to do. Well, we're going to see more. I'd like to quote from a little book that I got. I was just kind of cruising through one day, and, and I, I just saw this quote, and I go like, well, that's really interesting, so I ordered the book. And it's pretty amazing. Um, music and geometry are very close bedfellows. And um, there's this, if, as we start to look at how the planets are just in our own solar system, let's not even go into other galaxies or anything. We're just going to look in our own solar system. I'm going to show you a couple things, a couple patterns. 
And we, you don't have to write this all down, or if you want to, you can see me later and I can give it to you. But um, there are really interesting patterns that are created when we take a look at orbits, just within our own solar system. So I'm going to take a, give you a look at this. This is um, a pattern that comes out of um, three of the, just three of our, our planets. And this is their mean orbit patterns, okay? And that means um, if you were to draw, it's because planets kind of wobble a little bit and, and other things happen, and they're more elliptical and all these things. So I'm not going to get into that, but I want you to see the pattern. Whoops, that's not just notice the pattern up here, and then we're going to um, we're going to take it and draw it just a little more carefully. And you see that there's these pentagrams within a pentagram within a pentagram, and that's the geometry of just three of the planets. We're going to take a look at now. The, another interesting thing was because because I'm musical, I, um, they also talked about these different musical scales that were created using the planets as the notations for those musical scales, which I thought was really interesting because somebody back, way back, decided or discovered that there was a relationship between the planets and notes. Um, and part of that, we'll, we'll take another look at that in a couple more slides, in fact this slide. Um, there's really interesting numbers here. Earth and Venus kiss, that means they line up with the sun every 584 days and in eight earth years there's five kisses with Venus okay well there's some really interesting numbers here there's the the two the five the 13 the eight uh, the five all of these numbers are really interesting numbers because they they show up in nature all over the place I don't know, if, how many have heard the, the term golden mean? Okay. This is a sunflower, and you'll notice that there's a spiral in there. Okay. And if you take a look at a pine cone, in fact, let's take a look. We've got a shell here. It's got the same kind of... Let's take another look at a galaxy. It's got the same thing. So what are we seeing here? What we're seeing is the golden mean. And what you have is what are called Fibonacci numbers. And when you start with 1, you add 1 plus 1, you get 2. When you add 1 plus 2, you get 3. When you add 2 plus 3, you get 5. When you get 5 plus 3, you get 8. 8 plus 5 is 13. 13 plus 8 is 21. 21 plus 13 is 34. 34 plus 21 is 55. And you, you keep on going. And if you what, what you do is you take and make a rectangle with one with the last number on one edge and the next number on the other, and you get this spiral shape. And math, even in the stock market, you can actually predict fairly reliably the stock market going up or down based on Fibonacci numbers. If you go play blackjack, you can tell when you're going to win a hand and when you're going to lose a hand by the Fibonacci numbers pretty closely. The only problem is how much do you have out there and what are you going to lose when you sit <laughs> there? You know, so I don't even go there. But anyway, um, but these numbers show up everywhere. So why am I talking about these numbers? Well, this is another pattern. Um, this is made up of uh, Mercury and Venus. Let's see, this was, uh, this is, uh, if we draw the, the, um, a line from Earth to Venus every couple of days through that eight-year cycle we were talking about, this is the pattern you start to get. And then we'll take another one, uh, Mercury to Venus and then Mercury to Earth, and you end up with this kind of a pattern. Have you ever seen the spiral, okay, you're talking, it's the, the spiral graphs that kids play with? I think, well, Yahweh has a spirograph. <laughs> and um, you'll find what's, what's fascinating, I mean, I'm just showing you just a couple of, but what you'll find is these patterns are all over. Here, this is just the way of, of how to start the, the Venus Earth um, one. And then, um, you know, I won't get too bogged down in here. Uh, 
But once again, we, you see the number 13. Well, that's another one of the Fibonacci numbers. So, and this is the intricate design when you take that full 13-year pattern and put it all together. Absolutely gorgeous. I, I, it just blew my mind when I saw it. When I got this little book, I was going there and going, whoa, you know, this is just like so amazing. <clears throat> now, how many of you knew that the, that the solar system drew patterns like that? You do. Okay, so you're one of a very few people that has been exposed to that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even get there, but that's a whole other side because even our proportions of how long our arm is to how long our feet is, our legs, and all that, it's all Fibonacci numbers. In fact, if we don't follow those lines, we look really weird. <laughs> And some uh, pathological conditions have defied those numbers, and that's why they've turned out like that. Um, and not their fault either, I say. Now this is a really fun one. This is, um, this is Jupiter and Earth um, over each other, and this is the, the Triton moon, or Trojan moon, of, and the positions and the, where it lines up with the Earth, and you get this this uh, Mogan David Star of David pattern. In there. <clears throat> this is another thing that I had never realized. Have you ever seen the sun dogs? You know, it's like a little bit of rainbow when it's kind of a um, cold day or, or there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. Well, the exact angles of where those are in relation to the sun if, if it all of a sudden went dark, you would see Venus and Mercury behind those positions. <laughs> well, I'll show, there's another picture here, we'll show it to you there. So, where you see the first sun dog, that's where Mercury's orbit is. Where you see the outer sun dog, that's where Mar um, Venus' is, um, orbit is. And that, so those are precise angles that are that we find. So that's you know okay. So that's the pattern. So Yahweh has. I just wanted to establish that Yahweh is very mathematical from the standpoint of geometry. And uh, so another thing I wanted to take a look at was okay. Let's. What are we talking about when we talk about distances in space? Okay. So, so what happens is 186,000 miles per second is how far light travels. That's fast. <laughs> That's really fast. Uh, we don't have anything that comes near going that fast. Even the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> well, actually they claim to, but it's just on TV. But anyway, because that's what warp factor one is, is the speed of light. So if you've ever watched Star Wars, but anyway. Um, so, how far can light travel? Now, you know, if we get in an airplane, we, Shirley and I fly a lot. We, we have two grandkids in Australia, so we have to jump on an airplane to get down and see them. And so, that airplane goes, usually, depends on how fast the wind's blowing against it, but usually you'll get at least 500 miles an hour out of that airplane. So, it's going to take you f over about four hours just to get across the United States. It takes us 16 hours to get down to Australia. It's, you know, it's a long time to be in an airplane. <laughs> um, so, but light, if we were traveling at the speed of light, we would just be there in not even a second. It would just be that, it would be fast. Um, I, I, I forget how long it takes the sun's light to get to us, but it's just a few, just about a minute or so, or a couple of minutes, would it? Eight minutes, okay, good. So, so that's 93 million miles away, so eight minutes light travels 93 million miles. So, let's take a look at this, let's multiply it out. We've got 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. So when you multiply those out, you end up with 5 trillion, 865 billion, 696 million miles in one year. That's how far light can go. And in just a few minutes, I'll, I'll pull this together to tell you why we're going through this, these big numbers and things. But 
the closest star to us, well, the sun is our closest star, so it's 93 million miles, but the next closest is Alpha Centauri, which is actually a triple star system. It's 4.24 light years away. That's the closest, and that's still in our galaxy. Okay? We're not even talking about getting outside of our galaxy. So, um, David said in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. So, my belief, he, he must have at least been an amateur astronomer because he's, he knew something about what the heavens were doing to declare the glory of God. Psalm 8, 33 and 40 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you would visit him. So I think David understood something about how big Yahweh is and how big his universe is. Um, I didn't get a picture of this up, I should have probably, but anyway, when Voyager was exiting our solar system, it took a, it took a picture looking back. And it's an amazing picture because unless you really look carefully, you'll miss it. But there's a there's kind of a flare because of the sun the way the sun's hitting the lens. And in the middle of that flare is this teeny blue dot. Like a speck of dust. And that little blue dot is the earth. That's how small we are. But that's also how significant we are. Because if you think about it, scientists have only have, have been looking and looking and looking for another possible Earth, another possible planet that could sustain life like Earth does. And they found about eight possible candidates, but every single one of them has something that's not quite right. And that's in galaxies after galaxies after galaxies throughout millions of light years away from us. And yet here we are sitting on this little blue dot. And it's perfect. If we were a little closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were a little further away, we'd freeze up. We are in the perfect position. And by the way, we got here by accident, right? <laughs> I find it so amazing, the, 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 the closer you look and the farther you look, the more convinced I believe you have to be that we were created, we have a purpose, Yahweh is, we are significant. So, this is what I want you to get the picture of, is how big it is, but how small we are, but how significant. <clears throat> Yahweh said, let there be light, and there was light, and I think he, it says, um, I think what is it, in Psalm 29, Yahweh says that the, vo David says that the voice of Yahweh breaks trees, it thunders, it divides flames, it causes earthquakes, it's majestic. So, there was a big bang. Yahweh said, let there be light, and bang, and there was light. You know? <laughs> so, and... The, I don't, you know, I still don't know the procession of how he did it. I'm gonna, that's going to be a great video to watch when we get a chance to watch that. Uh, you know, did you do the sector first, and you know, and, or, you know, I don't know how he did it. But you know, what's really interesting to me is that scientists, physicists, are starting to understand that there has to have been a, de uh, a designer in place. Um, let's take a look at Psalm 148. Praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh from the heavens, praise Him in the heights, praise Him all His angels, praise Him all His hosts, praise Him sun, moon, praise Him all you stars of light, praise Him you heavens of heavens, and you waters that are above the heavens, let them praise the name of Yahweh for He commanded and they were created. He has established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass. Praise Yahweh from the earth, you dragons, and all deeds, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, 
mountains and hills, fruitful trees, and all cedars, beasts and cows, creeping things and flying fowls, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes, judges of the earth, both young men and old maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of Yahweh, for his name alone is excellent, his glory is above earth and heaven. He also exalts the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise Yahweh. I hope this is, um, what does it mean for the heavenly host to praise? And I hope I can get this up here. Show you a couple more stars. This one is called the Vela Pulsar. And it's magnificent. It's a thousand light years away. It's a highly magnetized neutron star. Right. <laughs> it simply means this star exploded into a supernova. And in the case of the Vela Pulsar, it collapsed back on itself in a magnetic entity. And as the pulsar, it began oscillating on its axis. This one oscillates 11 times a second on its axis. And that doesn't seem to move anybody tonight, so I just encourage you to when you get back to the hotel to oscillate 11 times a second on your axis and <laughs> you will appreciate the Vela Pulsar in a different way. And as it is oscillating, you can see what's happening. It's shooting a radio frequency out of itself. And so not only do we have this amazing photograph but we're determined to hear somebody speaking to us. And so through SETI and other highly advanced um, electromagnetic telescope programs, we're listening to the universe day and night. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when I say we, I mean we as in your tax dollars are paying large sums of money to build radio telescopes that circle the earth to continually listen to see if anybody out there is speaking to us. To date, we have not heard any intelligent life speaking back to us, but we have gotten something for our money because when they aimed the radio telescopes at the Vela Pulsar, this is what they heard. And this is what this guy does 24-7, day and night, 365 days a year. This is what, from a thousand light years away, the Vela Pulsar sounds like right now. This is it. Listen to this. about you, but I, that blew me away. I'm thinking, wow, this is incredible. You're like, well, what does it mean? I don't know. Is that some kind of Morse code for something or what does what, what all that mean? I don't know what it means, but, and I don't want to, you know, go too crazy here, but maybe the Vela Pulsar got wind somehow innately of Psalm 148 verse 3 and says, it says, praise him, sun and moon and all you shining stars. We're a shining star. We should praise him. Well, how are we going to praise him? I know. Let's oscillate 11 times a second on our axis and see if we can send a radio signal into the universe that would join in the symphony of of God's praise from all creation. It's singing. The stars are singing to him. I recently stumbled on 47 Tuck. It's a, a beautiful uh, cluster of stars. We'll show you the picture of it here. It's about um, 16,700 light years away from where we are. And you can see just this brilliant, it looks like a sort of he shoved a lot of diamonds together into a pile. It's an um, unbelievable number of stars there. Look at these. They blow up that central place right there. There are 12 of these super giant blue stars in there. But the things that are of interest to us tonight are these millisecond pulsars. 23 millisecond pulsars are there. And we've recorded 16 of them. And right now tonight, while we're sitting in this room, the 16 recorded millisecond pulsars and 47 tuck are making this sound right now. Beautiful. 
who knew? You know, God has his own string section. He's isn't that beautiful. And we just looked at one 11 times a second pulsar and 16 millisecond pulsars, and you start seeing Psalm 48 come to life. But look down at verse 7. It says, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people. So now he's bringing us in. We've got the heavens. We have the host. We have the stars, the sun, the moon. And now he says to the earth and he names everything on the earth in some form or fashion. And then he brings in us kings of the earth, verse 11, and all people, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. I love that he starts with you great sea creatures. We were in Hawaii a few months ago, and it was whale season there, and and I was captivated by these giant beasts, and they, they seemed like they were putting on a show for us. They'd splash up and roll over and spout and blow and it was beautiful. And as we were talking to some of the natives about the whales and asking all these questions, how do they get here every year and how do they know to come to the same place to have their their young, their offspring and how do they know how to journey? And he said, oh, you know, the whales, one of the main ways they get around is through the whale songs that they sing. And I got Psalm 148 all inside of me, and I'm like, no kidding, I, 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 I'm sure they do. And so I got to figure out what the whales sing, and so I start doing a little research, and I go online to find the whale songs, and I just want to bring it to you, because some of you living in Minnesota and don't even know where an ocean is, and so <laughs> the, the whale songs could sound like this right here. Take a listen. Psalm 148, coming to life right in front of us tonight. That's, that's, what, that's what's happening in all creation. And I had this crazy idea, and I, I, um, I don't know if you know what a mashup is or not, but I had this crazy mashup idea. And I started trying to think, what would it be like to be God? Because we so elevate our, our songs. And that, this is no comment on, on what we've sung tonight. I'm a songwriter, and I believe in artists. And I, I believe in what we do in corporate worship through song and through music. And, and one of the expressions of our worship. But I don't think we have a clue, because we don't know the expanse of the worship that is continually surrounding the throne of God. And our songs are great, but God isn't banking on our songs, because He is surrounded by a symphony that's bigger than our wildest dreams tonight. Stars sing and whales sing and the birds fly. And I just tried to imagine what would it sound like if you could just for a second be God and hear what he hears. And I can't get us there tonight, but I I came close. I had a friend who helped me with this little iPad program. And and I'm not a DJ, but just a a little thing, just quickly. And I I want you to see how this works. I I brought this guy in. Um, He's um, not somebody that we had a going already, but um, I brought one guy in. He, he should, you should be hearing him by now. I don't know. Are we, are we on? Yeah, if we could get just a little more volume, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Just even a little more volume would be fantastic. Thank you. I'm kind of maxed out here. There we go. This guy, we didn't look at his picture. He's PSR B0329-54. And he's only rotating one and a half times per second, which is not all that much, but we need him in our little experiment we're going to do here, okay? Um, and then we had the Vela Pulsar. You remember the Vela Pulsar, right? So that's that guy. 
but that's a little too fast for what we're trying to do, so we're going to slow that down, okay? Now this is unedited. It's just two pulsars slowed down and put in sync with each other. It's not a real groovy crowd, I know, but I, I know where I am, but it's kind of groovy if you hear it. And some of you want to nod a little bit, but you don't know if that's allowed at a reform meeting, and so um, you just do as the spirit leads. But isn't that cool? That's just two pulsars. And so we're going to put the, uh, the millisecond guys in there, the ones you just heard. Here they come. Undoctored and unedited. Here they come. So we just got two pulsars and then 16 others and some whales, and we got something going. But I was asking what you're asking because some people, some people need it really clear. Like, what are they singing? And we tried this, and you just got to know this is unedited. We just dropped this on, and this is what happened. This is what they might be singing. What do you think? Awesome. Isn't that awesome? Who's that guy? 
That's Louis Giglio. You can find him on YouTube. That, I just pulled that off of YouTube, actually. And, uh, it just, isn't that just a thought? First of all, when I'm tempted to just sit in my seat with my hands in my lap, and I then am reminded that the whales are praising Yahweh, I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, like, Get up and sing. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. Amen. The universe, L-O-U-I-E, Giglio, G-I-G-L-I-E-O, I go. I got it down there. Anyway, um, anyway <laughs> that just, to me, that just, if we can begin to understand that we're a part of his creation. We're not all of his creation. You know, let's just get off of our egocentric selves here for a moment and understand that we are invited to join creation in praising our Heavenly Father. And the question might be asked also, why is the universe so big if there's only maybe eight possible <laughs> Um, planets that could maybe support life. Why did Yahweh to go go to all this trouble to put this huge universe out there that's millions and millions of light years from from galaxy to galaxy, and each galaxy has billions of solar systems in it? I mean, when is enough enough? <laughs> Part of the answer to that question, for me at least, is we have to remember that Yahweh is constantly displaying His creativeness, His power, His ability to sustain, and, by the way, remind us that we are not the center of the universe. <laughs> In reality, we're in one little teeny corner way off in a quadrant way off in the middle. <laughs> and yet, once again, I'm not here to tell you how insignificant you are by looking at those distances and sizes. I'm trying to help you understand how significant you are. That the creator, sustainer, who has the ability to put all that in place, like David said, when you were in darkness, in your mother's womb, he was knitting you together. He was putting things in you that he didn't put in anybody else. That if you don't express it, the world will lose. Because you have a piece of the puzzle that nobody else has. One of the basic laws of physics says that everything, if you leave it alone, gets more disorderly, not more orderly. So I can't figure out this evolution thing because it says that everything, if you leave it alone, gets more orderly. <laughs> and that same scientist that says that will tell you that entropy tells you that it... And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> If I leave my harp alone, in fact, I don't know if you were watching me tune, I, I had to tune it twice because it, I had left it alone for about a week, bouncing up and down on the bed on our trailer, and it was quite out of tune. And it took me two times before, I thought it'd be, before it started staying where it needed to be. And that's entropy. We are, we are subject to entropy. And I would suggest to you that if we don't frequently tune, we will be out of tune. <laughs> Kelly came by and says, if only we could just do a little wrench on our own. <laughs> <laughs> Many scientists are beginning to think that maybe there is some kind of designer. Um, they're not going to say it's God. <laughs> but there's so much patterns and things out there, it's there. maybe there's a designer. We, we can't give him a name, but maybe we'll just call him the designer. 
So, um, Genesis says, in the beginning of God, you know, these scientists, I think it's kind of funny, they expect us to, to take them seriously. When, first of all, they keep rewriting their books every other year because they find out something that trashes that theory, and so then they bring another theory out there and try to get us to believe it like it's fact. <clears throat> but you know what? Yahweh was there. He actually did it. <laughs> And he says he did it in six days. Scientists say, that's impossible. You could never do that. Well, who, which one are you going to believe? I know who I'm going to believe. It's the person I have experience with. You know, Richard Dawkins, I don't know if any of you know who he is. He's probably one of the biggest atheists out there. In fact, that film... Um, uh, there is a God uh, that, first of all, says there's no God, and then he crosses out, and there is. And he's challenged in the, uh, the kids challenged in the classroom. Um, Richard Dawkins' name comes up because he challenges any creationist to come and change his mind. And then we have, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name right now. Can't help mine, yeah. He goes around the universities and challenges atheists to come in and convince him that they have. So it's kind of fun to watch watch out where it's Kent's really fun. We got to meet with him last summer, and it's just he's a blast. But anyway, um, he can basically take an atheist and tear him apart in about three minutes. <laughs> so, but let's but let's just go here. Richard Dawkins says that we we just got here through this process, accidental process of evolution that that took what, you know, first of all, it didn't even have a cell, but then somewhere in the myriads of time, because, you know, if you make time last long enough, you can finally come up with a probability that might work. And so some lightning hit a puddle that had some mud in it and somehow formed some amino acids into a cell. And then that cell started finally, you know, over several other millions, billions of years, finally decided, learned how to divide itself and make another cell. And then, you know, all of those cells started getting together and finally it's formed this little amoeba, or, what, you know, or I guess amoeba is a cell, but formed this little multicellular organism. And then, you know, you know like Brad Scott says, from me to you by way of the zoo, you know, <laughs> or from, from amoeba to you by way of the zoo. But, um, So, we, so he goes on to say, we have no purpose to be here. There's no reason why we're here. Um, we're all going to die. Humanity's going to die. Not just you and me die at the end of our life, but humanity's headed for extinction. Um, animal, all life on Earth eventually will become extinct. The Earth eventually will get to the point where it's not going to be able to sustain any life all of the light in the universe is going to grow dimmer and dimmer. Space is going to get colder and colder. And eventually, it's all just going to be dark. Isn't that just wonderful? Isn't that, isn't that just a wonderful future to look forward to? I really feel sorry for poor Richard. He's, you know, you know Carl Sagan's talking about the billions and billions and there's no God and he's passed away. I don't know what he's thinking now. But anyway, um, you know, it's, so these people, and they're, you know, they're really smart. I know they got straight A's, they have PhDs, and, they, you know, so because they're so smart, I guess we're supposed to listen to them and trust them, but to tell you the truth, I, don't, I have no experience with Richard Dawkins. I don't know if he can even, you know, I don't even know how he eats his breakfast or whatever. I, I have no relationship with the person, and yet he expects me to believe him, to have faith in him, his word. But I do have experience with Yahweh. I can tell you story after story after story of how Yahweh has stepped into my life and changed circumstances. And I'll bet most of you could too if I gave you the chance. And to me, that's what faith is based on. Faith is based on, a, on an experience that I have with a person. 
And so when Yahweh tells me that he created me and that he gave me a purpose and that while I was in my mother's womb, he was knitting me together, I believe that. And by the way, I really like that version a whole lot better than Richard Dawkins' version. And I think most of you do too. <laughs> Um, so it does come down to faith. I believe that our Creator based everything on sound, and that, that kind of answers the question, so why, am I, why have I taken so long to, to show us the patterns of the universe, the size of the universe, the, the fact that Yahweh is our Creator, and have faith in the fact that what He says is true. Why is that so important if, we if we're now taking a look at the frequencies or sound? And as I said right at the beginning, I believe Yahweh sang his creation into existence. Um, there's a really interesting thing that's coming up. Machio Kapu, and I'm probably going to have to um, unplug here again. He's a physicist. He's, he's a prominent physicist. Um, and his... Um, main expertise is that he is a proponent of string theory. And so I'm just going to play a little clip of what he says about string theory. That's Michio Kaku there. Well, physics plotted along for many decades. We worked out atomic bombs, we worked out stars, we worked out laser beams, but recently we discovered string theory. And string theory exists in 10 and 11 dimensional hyperspace. Not only that, but these dimensions are super. They're super symmetric. A new kind of numbers that mathematicians never talked about evolved within string theory. That's why we call it super string theory. Well, the mathematicians were floored. They were shocked because all of a sudden, out of physics came new mathematics, super numbers, super topology, super dif differential geometry. All of a sudden, we had supersymmetric theories coming out of physics that then revolutionized mathematics. And so the goal of physics, we believe, is to find an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, which will allow us to unify all the forces of nature and allow us to read the mind of God. And what is the key to that one inch equation? Supersymmetry. A symmetry that comes out of physics, not mathematics, and has shocked the world of mathematics. But you see, all this is pure mathematics. And so the final resolution could be that God is a mathematician. And when you read the mind of God, we actually have a candidate for the mind of God. The mind of God, we believe, is cosmic music, the music of strings resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. That is the mind of God. Okay. So, the phrase that I wanted to, to um, the, reason why, the reason why I put that in there is First of all, he said, God is a mathematician. And everything we've been looking at proves that, I think. Everything, even the designs, are mathematical. There are mathematical equations that describe all of those designs. And string theory comes down to the idea that there's all these subatomic particles. I'll just explain a little bit more of what I understand of string theory. I mean, there's probably somebody that understand it better than me, but the Hadron Collider in Switzerland has been classifying different subatomic particles. And the, the, the fact is, they have never seen any of these particles. The only thing they're classifying is they're saying, well, if there is this, you know, because the way matter works, that means there has to be this particle and that particle, and they have to operate this way in order for matter to be what matter, and dark matter to be dark matter, and all these other things. And so what they, they say, 
So they predict if there is that particle, then we should see these results. And so they they accelerate these particle oh, these materials through the beam the um, accelerator, and they smash them together. And when they smash them, that breaks everything into those smaller particles, and they measure these effects of these particles. And so, like the Higgs boson, which they call the God particle, they they said if if there is a Higgs boson and it gets smashed and it and it splits off, we should see this. And lo and behold, they saw it, and they go like, "We found it! We found it!" But nobody's seen it. <laughs> It's still we're all we're seeing is the effects, and what string theory says is there's not just there's not a bunch of different particles, there are there's a string, and I can take that same string and put a different tension on it, and I get a different note. It's the same string but different tensions, and that's the idea behind string theory is that, and so when he says a cosmic orchestra, that really got my attention. Because I believe that's starting to come into how Yahweh created, how He sustains, what we what He made us out of. So, yeah, I better get this done. There's probably some stomachs growling out there. Um, so if 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 Yahweh sings. Just think about this. He breathes over the water. Boom. The earth. He breathes into Adam. He sings into Adam. Boom. Adam's alive. All of these things take place. So, what is, what if, and I'd like to just create a little scenario. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were created by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So here he is, he's picking up this dirt and forming Adam, and then he's breathing into him. Think about it, is it possible that as he bends down to form Adam, he's thinking about, because he, he knows what th what's coming. He knows that Adam's going to fall, he knows that we're going to have this 6,000 years of degrading and toxics and all kinds of stuff that are going to come at us. He forms Adam in a way that he knows um, it's going to be able to withstand that onslaught. And he also knows that 4,000 years down the road, he's going to come into that history and die for us, redeem us. And so, as he breathes into Adam, he, he's breathing in a tune. I know. And when Yeshua comes on the earth through being born of Mary, it's interesting to me that there's times when um, through the book of John, Yeshua says, he says, I haven't done one thing that did I not, my father did not tell me to say. I haven't spoken one word my father did not tell me to speak. I haven't done one action that my father did not tell me to do. So what he's doing, what I see him doing, in fact there's places where it says he lifts his eyes. He's, he's looking up, he's checking up, he, and if you please, you know, I'll put it in my music language, he's tuning, he's tuning. He's coming into his, to the Heavenly Father's frequency. And my question is, don't we need to do that same thing? And that's why I'm, I'm thinking more and more and more that these frequencies are so important because if 528 frequency is the creative frequency that Yahweh, and I believe it is, I believe it's, it, when I work out in the Hebrew letters, the yod Hey vav Hey, it comes out to be the 528 frequency. Um, so I believe that Yeshua, as our example, is showing us how to walk out. In fact, he said at the end of John, he said, These things that I've been doing, will you do, and more. Okay, well how are we going to do those things and the more? The same way he did. By checking up, by retuning, by 
by keeping to the to the standard. When a when an orchestra gets ready to play, Dean knows this more than anybody probably. They sound a note, and every single instrument tunes up to that note. If they didn't do that, you'd have some of them flat and some of them sharp, and you'd have probably a noise, and it wouldn't be music at all. But because they tune, everybody plays together in unity, which, as Psalm 133 says, commands a blessing. So, I don't know if I want to, I don't know time-wise, how hungry is everybody? Do I have about 15 minutes? Okay. All right. This is just a little review. This is out of this is where the frequencies come out of Numbers chapter seven, starting with verse twelve. It goes all the way through eighty-three. I won't get real into it. I have uh, a YouTube that goes through this, so you can do it as many times as you want to. Um, but essentially, you you get the three ninety-six frequency, the four seventeen frequency, the five twenty-eight frequency, the six thirty. I'm sorry, 639, the 741, and the 852 frequencies out of these. The pat and I'll, I'll underline just real quickly, there's a pattern that's being shown here in these verses. And that pattern is repeated. First of all, the, the six verses that this pattern comes out of is repeated 12 times because it's one for each of the tribes. This is they're bringing their their gifts of dedication to the tabernacle is just being set up and just beginning to be brought into use. And so there's this first day, second day, third day, which each one of those is six verses. But the pattern that you see of the numbers happens four times. Those numbers come up four times in that, in that whole listing there. So it's, um, to me, there's things that we are, if we look into it a little bit deeper, we find that there's something that we can learn there. And my sense is that these, it's amazing to me that these um, numbers reflect exactly the frequencies. There's no deviation. They're exactly the same as the frequencies. So what's the chance of that happening? You know, a lot of people say, well, how do you know that's frequencies? Well, I don't, I can't say for sure that that's frequencies, but I do know that there are very important frequencies that have been identified as far back as the year 1000 AD that are called sophagio frequencies. And every single one of those six frequencies is the exact same as those numbers there. Is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. And it's, it's too bad in many respects that the New Age people have been all over these frequencies and we've been sitting back on oh, what do you have anything to do with that? That's new age. And the reality is this is something that Yahweh put in his word way back. <laughs> Motion. Okay? So as I tell people, as much as I'm not gonna let the gays have my rainbow, because that's my promise from Yahweh. I'm not going to let the New Age people have my frequencies, because that's what God would do. Okay? So let's, let's redeem what the Father has given us. And, um, and that's why I've gotten, every all recordings I do now are in the 528. I, I just believe that there's enough of a difference. And I've done blind testing with people. I've said, now listen to this song, not in 528. Now listen to this one, and I don't tell them which is which. I just say, you know, tell me what you think about this one, and then tell me what you think about this one. And blind testing, every time everybody, the people will pick out the 528, there's just something, and I believe it's DNA level, because we were created with 528. So we're, we're not, and Pam's going to be sharing with you about what innately the Father has placed in us that if we learn to tune into it, it's going to be a, a great assistance in our lives. So, you know, so many of us have finally gotten to this place because of everything that gets thrown at us every day from every single angle. We start to just kind of tune stuff out. You know, it's just like, you know, I just want to live my life, just leave me alone, you know. <laughs> but 
there are things that we learn to pay attention to that can actually enhance our life. And that's what Pam's going to be talking about. Part of what you're going to be talking about. Um, so let me just do real quick here. Um, about two years ago, I, uh, we put together Tabernacle Frequency. And I think last time I talked about it, did I? Any of you remember? So, okay. So, and I, um, what comes out is that as we were showing there in Numbers chapter 7, that's right next to the tabernacle being set up. So Shirley asked me one morning, she said, you know, I'm, I'm reading here and there's six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. Do you think there's a relationship between the six frequencies you're talking about and the, each of those pieces of furniture? And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. So then about 15 minutes later, she said, you know that thing you do with the Psalms where you take the Hebrew text and you work out the chord progressions? And so what would happen if you took the descriptions of each of the pieces of the furniture and worked out the chord progressions there? And, you know, what do you think would happen? I said, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Let me do that. Let's find out what's there. And amazingly, each of the chord progressions for each of the pieces of furniture highlighted a different one of those frequencies. And what's even more amazing is, you know, and I, I say it's amazing because I, you know, I'm kind of like stumbling over this, but obviously Yahweh put it in place way back, you know, when he was designing it. But when you are out at the outer court with the brazen altar where the burnt offerings are placed, that's the lowest frequency. When you come to the labor where the priests would wash after doing the sacrifice, well, first of all, they washed there and then they did the sacrifices, and then they came back and washed before they went into the tabernacle. That's the next frequency, the next higher. That's 417, 396, then 417. And then you come in to the holy place, and the menorah is the next step up, it's the 528 which everybody calls the miracle frequency. And wouldn't Yeshua be the light of the world? And, I mean, there's so many things that it, so many ways that it fits, that just keeps on going. And then you come over to the table of showbread, and you get the next higher frequency, which is the, the uh, 639. And then you get up to the um, altar of incense, which is the 741. And then, you, and then you finally enter into the Holy of Holies or the Ark of the Covenant and you're at the 852, the highest frequency. Yahweh told Moshe, he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Adam and Eve made a really bad choice. It said, we're told that before they fell, Every in the cool of the evening, they would sit down with Yahweh and have conversations. And I'm sure he was teaching them things. I'm sure there was many, many different things, just setting up relationship um, that was going on. But when they fell, they had to be placed out of the garden. They had to be taken out. Shirley has a teaching where she puts forth the idea that the Garden of Eden was actually a Hadar, if you're talking wedding language. And there's so much wedding language in Scripture. And Yahweh prepared for them the Garden of Eden, and they were brought into the Garden of Eden. And if you think of it as a Hadar or a wedding chamber, what really took place was they committed adultery in the wedding chamber. They chose a different husband besides Yahweh. That's an amazing thought right there. But they were, they had to go out because they chose a different husband. But Yahweh wasn't willing to let that go. He began to create ways for them to come back into his presence. And the tabernacle is one of the one of the main ways. And like I said, let them make me sanctuary so that I may dwell among. You know, Yahweh actually walked in the camp of Israel. It's, they were, there were certain things they were supposed to take care of certain ways so that he wouldn't step in it. <laughs> because he says, I walk among you. Okay? So I believe that these frequencies related to each of the pieces of furniture 
related to the colors, related to the incense, related to the metals that were used. Everything was part of frequencies that were retuning us back into his being able to come back into his presence. We don't have a tabernacle right now, so what are we going to do? Well, Paul tells us what we're going to do. He says, what? Don't you know that you are the tabernacle? That you're the temple? So my sense is that today, one of the reasons why we're getting an understanding of these frequencies back, I think, it's something that's returning. I don't think this is new. I think this we're just rediscovering. And it's not just me. There are others that I've been in touch with that are coming to the same conclusions and understandings. That these frequencies, as we worship, as we, I have a friend that's in Virginia that she plays my CDs all day long, every day. We were visiting her and I said, don't you get a little tired of that? She said, you know what? She said, my days go so much better when these frequencies are going through my home. She said, I just play it all the time. I just put it on repeat and it goes all the time. And my life is different now because of that. So, I just am simple enough to believe that we're being brought into this understanding because this is what we need for the times we're in. We're being bombarded once again by the news, by the entertainment, by everything, to get our eyes off. You know that simple little song, turn your eyes on Yeshua, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I just believe that these frequencies are being shown to us to help us um, turn our backs on the world, retune, refocus, come back into our Father's presence, into His design. Think about the word disease. Everybody talking, well, I have this disease, I have this, that disease. Well, what is disease? It's dis-ease. It's, I believe it's being out of tune. And I think a lot of diseases could be taken care of if we would just get back into it. Yeah. So, um, and I, I tell you, uh, because of the website, I have people picking me up from all over the world, and I get emails after emails after emails of what, and it's, I, I have to tell you over and over again, I try to make this as plain as I can, this is not my music, this is just Yah's music that he's given me to play on the heart. And I've recorded it and i made it available. Because I can't be everywhere. I can't take my harp over to New Zealand and play it. Um, we were there a couple of years ago and a lady lent me her harp to play while I was there. But if things are available, <clears throat> and I've got it in MP3s now, so people don't even have to get the CD, they can instantly download it. There it is, they've got it. And I've got a lot of free stuff right up front that they can just play without even having to pay anything, or whatever. And everything's donation anyway, because I don't want to be caught selling what Yahweh has given me. And so, I'm not trying to um, put out there that um, I'm selling CDs and stuff, and you, know, you need my music. No, I think what's going on is the Father has given me an understanding of His music. And I'm interpreting His music with the heart, but it's His music. And the effects that are taking place, what I'm getting feedback all the time, is because it's his music, because it's what he's doing. There's things happening in people's lives, I don't even know who they are, but it's happening. Not because it's me, but because it's him. And so I just wanted to, just, um, just one the final thing, I'll just go through these real quickly. The 396 frequency helps us expand our awareness. And that's why I think it's associated with the, the altar of birth offering. Because that's where we recognize we, we're, that we're out of tune. We recognize that something's wrong with us and that we need to get it fixed. And so we bring that, you know, and, and we're not doing sacrifices anymore, but what does David say? He said, you know, does he delight in burnt offering? No, but to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen in the fat of rams. And then another place he says the lifting of our hands is the evening sacrifice. So so we can still bring sacrifices to the tabernacle that is, that is us. We are the tabernacle. 
before Yahweh because it's to Him. The next one is the 417, which is the um, labor, and that's the liberating. That's that's releasing. It's washing. It's taking taking it off, taking it away, um, removing it from being in contact with us. That's what's taking place in the labor. And we have a, a little book in the back. Um, later on, we'll, we have stuff. And once again. This is Shabbat. We're not going to sell anything. Um, you're welcome to take whatever you want. Um, and if you want to leave a donation for helping us put fuel in our tanks, that's fine. Um, but there is a book that, that goes along that Shirley wrote that goes that has all of these things listed in it as well. And there's actually a process if you want. It's a suggestion. You can change it around all you want, whatever you feel in your heart. But it's a way of walking through the sanctuary with each of the, and having a station at each of these places where you do business with the Father to bring you into that place where you progress into the next one. The next one is, the, is, as I said, is the menorah. And this is where a lot of um, brokenness is, is restored. Um, it's also where we put ourselves in front of the light and we ask, is there anything that we missed out there in the labor or the or the, that needed still needs to be burned? Because we might have missed something. And if there is, we can we can go back and we can take care of that and then come back. So the light also helps us to re-examine because it shows when there's an imperfection, the light will show the imperfection. And then we go to the um, table of showbread, which has the 639 frequency. And that's where relationship, the, the bread was called the Chem Panaim, the, the bread of, of the face. It's where we come face to face in relationship with Yahweh. And it's also reminding us that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth. So that the bread is, sustains us, and it's not just bread of food, but bread of the word. And Yeshua has also said, I am the bread of life. The altar of incense finally is preparing us to enter in. And that's the prayers of the saints. It says that they ascend day and night in Revelation. And so um, the incense is a reminder of that. And it's also said that the priests would actually take a, a pan full of incense that was releasing clouds of smoke and place that into the Holy of Holies before he entered so that there would be the that covering cloud of the prayers, the incense. The, and then he would enter in confidently before the, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the final step where we are finally restored because we're face to face with Yahweh. And we... You know, it's interesting, we think of things as a as kind of a courtroom scene, where you're always the judge. And the enemy's accusing us all the time. And the enemy's correct, because we have done those things. But Yeshua, in fact, in that book, Shirley talks about Yeshua stands at the altar of incense and says, yes, that's right, but my blood, my blood. And... Yahweh, so, and then Yeshua is saying, you know, they did go to the brazen altar, they did burn what needed to be burned. They did wash. They did come before the light and re-examine. They did come to the face for the, the sustenance. And now they're standing here ready to enter your presence. My blood, my blood. And Yahweh says, that's good enough for me. Enter in. So there, there we are. We come into His presence. So that's that's where we take these frequencies. That's where I see the great benefit of understanding these frequencies because each of the phases of our life is covered by one of those frequencies. And uh, what Pam is going to show you in her talk is, is is very specific ways that each of these frequencies has relevance to where we're at. Okay, 
That's where I'm at, so who says life is boring? Okay. Thank you all.